Welcome, we're joined by Eric Hakopian, an expert in American politics. We'll be discussing the end of the 2020 Karabakh war and what this means for Armenia and Armenians. Eric, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. So, what is the situation? What has happened? And I'd also like to ask specifically, what happened last night um, in Yerevan that saw the parliament and government bills, buildings ransacked? Well, uh, obviously, uh there's a tremendous amount of anger, confusion about this agreement, uh, even though we know most of what the agreement is, but not everything about the agreement. Uh, some of those scenes were frankly quite ugly, and I think uh, it was a combination of real anger from real people, and then I think it was taken advantage of by, to be kind, a group of opportunists and thugs who uh, uh, what was interesting about them is you have all of these people that are essentially saying the war should continue and they're all you know young fit guys who are good enough to tear a whole parliament apart but uh, they somehow never went to the front if they really want the war to go on so i think some of it was uh, uh the public anger and confusion is real but it was obvious that some political forces were trying to take advantage of that and use that for their benefit in trying to hurt the current government and with the 2020 war and now this subsequent peace agreement, what have we learned as Armenians? Well, let's take one step back. I think there's two things that we need to uh, uh, study. And the first thing is we need to admit defeat and we need to learn from it. Uh, we need to understand that uh, what brought us to this moment what caused the defeat, uh, to what extent all of us were responsible on some level, even obviously there's other people who are responsible a lot more than others. Uh, I think first we need to face that before we can move on. Uh, we shouldn't be Pollyannish about this. We need to admit what happened was a calamity and a defeat. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the end of the world, but we need to be realistic about it and, and learn from it. The second thing, and that's the negative ledger, I think in the positive ledger, and it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, 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 it's more factual than positive, is we need to be eternally grateful as a nation and as a people for this fantastic uh, effort that was put by this army that was outgunned, outnumbered, uh, out everything, for 43 days and essentially by their heroism and their very valuable lives uh, prevented a complete ethnic cleansing and genocide in Karabakh. So we need to be forever grateful for them and as, an, as, a, as a people we need to do everything we can to help uh, their families and be forever grateful to them. I think one thing that I've noticed in my conversations with people is I think since the government was always very positive about Hachteluang, Hachteluang, people really never understood what we were up against. Uh, Armenia was fighting six or seven countries and different forces. You had thousands of Turkish special forces there. You have Azerbaijan itself has an army twice the size of ours. Uh, you had massive elements of mercenaries and terrorists brought in by Turkey from Syria and other places. Uh, there's been reports of Pakistani uh, special forces uh, of Afghans that were brought in. Uh, so people need to understand that what our guys were fighting was not Azerbaijan. The closest analogy to this, historical analogy, a recent one, is really the 1940 Soviet invasion of Finland, in which the Finns, who were supposed to be defeated in a couple of days, held out for a month or two and by doing so preserved their independence despite the fact that they lost some territory. Armenia was taking on the combined powers of 90 to 100 million people. And that kind of imbalance cannot go on forever. Uh, we know from uh, uh, reports about uh, military attaches that the initial plan uh, this war was supposed to be somewhere between three to five days. And that's what everybody thought. In three to five days, uh, they would have cut across the south, gone up north, which is what happened, 
get to Shushi, and then the other group would have gone into Rapan, and it would have been checkmate, except that three or five days turned into 43 days. And in that process, by the heroism of these fantastic young people that we have, uh, they saved us from calamity. So those are the two primary things that, you know, we need to acknowledge first. But what do we learn from it? You know, you asked me, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on uh, beyond your question, but you asked what we learned from it. I just want to give it some background. These are the things we learned from it is uh, that the most important thing for us from this point on, and it has been in the past, is to create an Armenia that is democratic, prosperous, and just. Because everything else we want to do stems from that. Because if we don't have that, nothing else matters. The second thing is, uh, what we learn is that corruption kills. The corruption of the past 20 years, you know, our drones were in the houses of the oligarchs, our air defenses were, you know, in their bank accounts in Switzerland. That's reality. We have, to, we have to be cognitive of that and understand it and move on. The other thing is uh, vision, visionless or mediocre diplomacy kills. Uh, we have diplomats without any vision who essentially left this country alone and stranded when this, when this crisis started. Uh, the other thing is uh, Azerbaijan has friends in the world, we simply have acquaintances. Uh, they have friends that come through. Uh, ours are just, send us really nice words for the most part. That made a huge difference, as we know, in the last 43 days. So, and the most important thing that we should learn is that we should never, ever send our guys into battle without the most modern equipment that we can buy, even if we need to borrow money to do it. We cannot rely on using 19th century bravery and 20th century weapons to fight 21st century wars. It doesn't work. It can only take you so far. We as a collective have to pledge that our fighting men and women will never, ever go into battle without having the latest, most modern equipment to defend themselves and to win the war. Um, I want to ask, what does this war mean for Armenia and Armenians? And in terms of Armenian history, what does this moment mean for the future? Well, it's a calamitous moment uh, in, in so many ways. Uh, I mean, it's I don't want to exaggerate it, but I mean, it's close to what happened at the start of the last century uh, on the negative ledger. And we have to look at it in those terms because, let's be honest, the, the purpose and the mission of the other side was ethnic cleansing and genocide. That's never been not on the table. We all know that. Uh, so 100 years, 105 years after the first genocide, we were actually looking at a serious chance of a second one. But having said that, um, by having a state and by having enough of a wherewithal, we prevented the worst from happening. And I don't want to downplay that. We need to understand that. We need to appreciate that. Uh, there's, a different, there's a reason that what happened to the Yazidis isn't happening to us. is because we have a state and we have the ability to defend ourselves. Maybe not as much as we wanted to, but we can... We have the ability to fight and prevent the worst from happening. So those are the two things I would say. And is there anything else you would like to finally add? Uh, I think we have to look at, you know, what is it that we need to do from this point on? You know, I think uh, I would say there's two things. Uh, we need to prepare for war and we need to prepare for peace. It's not out of the question that this agreement that is done uh, holds for the next 50 years. There's plenty of examples of it, Cyprus, other places, that for different reasons, the parties don't want to start another war. However, the way this agreement is written, five years, the peacekeepers can be asked to leave. Uh, and if the peacekeepers leave, that's almost a 
a definite, definitive signal over another war, if any party asks for that, because why would you ask them to leave otherwise? Uh, so we need to prepare for what could come uh, and be prepared for it. And the way you prepare for it is we need to look at a development model of what I call the garrison state, where uh, we need to create our own military industrial complex. And that, that sounds like very high fluting for a country as small or as not affluent as Armenia, but the truth is in modern warfare, with all these new drones and other things going on, none of these things are exceptionally expensive and they're not really that hard to do. And we, there's plenty of Armenians around the world with money who, sh who can and should invest in that. So I think we need to create this garrison state model where you use the fact that we're always in a, we, we, we should always be ready for war as a way to develop your economy. I think on the other ledger, which is what I call the peace ledger, is we need to have a concerted effort to use the way Azerbaijan conducted the war against them as the absolute proof why we need remedial, remedial secession and recognition of Artsakh. Because there's no more excuses, there's no more refugees, there's no more land to give back. The issue now is, does Azerbaijan has a right to rule the people of Artsakh who've been independent for 30 years, have run themselves, and who Azerbaijan in this war proved whose intentions towards were genocidal and criminal. Azerbaijan, by the way, in this war proved that it shouldn't even be running its own people, ruling its own people, much less an, 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 a, a people from another ethnicity. Uh, just the way, the pitiful way that they handled their own uh, soldiers and what happens to them where they're injured. So I think we need to have this as a collective, this push on the one side, which is uh, focused on economic development and creating this garrison state, while at the same time being very aggressive in trying to get recognition for Artsakh, and by prosecuting Azerbaijan for the way it conducted the war in the criminal matter that it created the war, because that's the prima facie evidence that they should have no, not only legal, but no moral right to rule the people of Artsakh. Eric, thank you as always. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.